Okay, so thank you again. Uh, my name is Mary Lopez Kiefer. I am a tribal member of the San Luis Rey Band of Mission Indians. Uh, the San Luis Rey Mission is located in Oceanside, California, in San Diego County, and uh, my ancestors um, come from that mission. Um, I'm also a senior advisor to the San Luis Rey Band of Mission Indians Tribal Council uh, and a member of the California Native American Heritage Commission and a member of the University of California's Office of the President's Native American Advisory Council. And it's my honor to be the co-chair of the uh, University of California's Critical Mission Studies Project. So many different hats. Uh, I'm also very excited because my son uh, joined us this afternoon um, and my husband. So this panel is um, entitled Telling the Truth of the California Missions. And we are going to hear um, from five different uh, academic leaders uh, in this area. And the first one we're going to hear from is Dr. Stanley Rodriguez, who is director and president of the Kumeyaay uh, Community College and a tribal council member of the Santa Isabel Ipai Kumeyaay Nation. And he's a great guy. <laughs> and he'll be talking about the impact of missions on language, culture, land claims, and sp spirituality. We'll next hear from, um, I th think they're out of order. <laughs> we'll next hear from Dr. Lee Panich, um, author of After St. Sarah, Unearthing Indigenous Histories at the California Missions. And he'll be talking about uh, centering Ohlone presence at Mission Santa Clara and Santa Clara University. Um, his... Um, He was going to be joined by uh, former Councilwoman um, Gloria Gomez from the Muekma tribe, uh, but unfortunately she was not able to be here today. And then we're gonna hear from Dr. Bernard Gordillo, uh, postdoctoral associate uh, of the Institute of Sacred Music at Yale University. And he's going to be speaking to us today about sounds, silences, and vestiges of California mission bells. And then we're going to end our panel discussion um, with Alexi Sigona from the Alma Mutsen Band and Annie Taylor um, from the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management at UC Berkeley. And they're going to be speaking to revitalizing reciprocal relations with land, Alma Mutsen's pathways to reconnection. Um, each of the panelists will be speaking about 15 minutes each. And then we'll finish the panel discussion with questions and answers. So if you, come, if you have questions, keep them to the end. Um, and then our panelists are happy to answer your questions. So we're going to go ahead and begin um, with uh, Dr. Stanley Rodriguez and his discussion on the impact of missions on language, culture, land claims, and spirituality. Thank you. Okay, 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Stan Rodriguez. I'm from the Santa Isabel Band of the Ipai Nation. And it's an honor for me to come up here. And when we talk about these things that, you know, the missions and how they've impacted our people, we need to first look at California, this area where the missions came. And some people would call this and I'll call it God's country. The land is beautiful. And the diversity that is here. When we talk about language diversity, there is more language diversity in California than any other part of the world, except for Papua New Guinea. That is something incredible. When we talk about, look, look at these trees. And when we talk about the redwoods, when we talk about you know, the, the oak, you know, the, the pinyon pine out into the desert, all these different, you know, areas that our people are part of, that our people live in, that speaks to the blessings that the people, our people had on these lands. And usually I, I start with a question asking, how many of you speak more than one language? I'm not going to do that because... Even though some of you raised your hand, that was beautiful. But, um, you know, I know you just couldn't take it. You had to do it. That's all right. But, but, you know, the point I'm making was it was very common for our people to speak four, five, six languages because of that language diversity, because communication is important. You see that in Europe. You see that in parts of Africa, Asia. What happened here? When we talk about language, we're also talking about the land land base, land mass. You know, we talk about this land that our, 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 our people are on, these lands, the traditional lands for the people in this area and other areas. When I ask sometimes, where is the holy land? People will say Jerusalem. I go, not for us. This is our holy land. Each mountain, each stream, the ocean, all these different places, the creator and our creation stories talks to us about that, teaches us about that. We learn about this because we are part of this. We're not here to control this land. We are a part of it. We have a reciprocal relationship, not just with the land, but with the animals, with all the things here, because we are part of this landscape. And our culture, you know, uh, I wanted to... Uh, Applaud, Mr. Valentin. I just got to share this, you know. Uh, Valentin and I were born at the same hospital. I, I, I have to throw that out, man. We were both born in Dearborn Hospital in Madera, California. It's not there anymore, but, but we, we came out of there. But, you know, when, you know when, when we talk about our culture, all these things that we have here, all these things that we pass on from our creation story, this land, it teaches us how to conduct ourselves. It teaches us how to live from the moment we are born to the moment we pass from this world to the next world. Everything is a teaching. There are rites of passage from a baby to a child to a young adult. And as they continue on, eventually becoming an elder, all these things have ceremonies that we would do, all these ceremonies that we would do, the way that our people took care of our, uh, the lands that, that we were in. You know, Mr. Valentin was talking about the, you know, the landscape out here because of burning. We have our own epistemology. We have our own organic science, our own fire science that helped this land. We, we helped each other. We were all healthy. This land, when we say this land is our mother, this land is truly all of our mother. She takes care of us and we take care of her. We do the best we can to take care of her. And the way we do that is the way we treat each other and the way we treat this land and our spirituality. You know, some people say that we're savages, that we're hunter-gatherers. They do not understand that we are close to the land, that all these things, all these ceremonies that we do were taught to us in our creation stories, were given direction by the creators to us. 
and we pass that knowledge on. I'm going to say this, ladies and gentlemen. We as Native people, we are no strangers to climate change. Many of our people, we have village sites that are under the Pacific Ocean at this time. It speaks to a time when we were here, the last ice ages. We say from time immemorial. We understand these things. In the desert, there's also fish trap sites. It speaks to a time when there was an ocean over there. Our people were there. Our people have this knowledge. All this knowledge, our sciences, all these things, ways of conducting ourselves. We're like the United Nations out here, dealing with many different groups. So then, so-called civilization came. September 27, 1542, Juan Cabrillo Rodriguez, no relation to me, came into California. What were they looking at? Look, they were looking at how to uh, uh, protect their assets coming in from Asia. And they were also looking for uh, places to do things, land that they could exploit. Many of you have been products of the school system, and you've heard that uh, the California missions came, and the Indians loved it. That is one of the most romanticized lies I've ever heard, because it's not the truth. Because our people, we fought. All of our people fought. And when the Spaniards came, I'm not going to say conquest. I'm not going to say we've endured three waves of conquest. We didn't. We've endured, we endured three waves of encroachment. But we are still here. If we are here, then that is resistance. Our ancestors are looking upon us now. But when they came, and they first came to San Diego in 1769 to put a mission there, and there were reasons why they did missions. And all these things that you hear about, oh, benevolence and everything, the, the truth of it is this. When the Spaniards overran the Mexica Empire, those governments were centralized. They were able to take it over quickly. But there were uprisings that took place. And they used uh, the warriors from, those, from many different enemy bands to help suppress these things. The Mishtan War took place. The Spaniards were almost defeated. But they got Tlaxcalan and Aztec warriors to, to help shore them up. And that was followed by the Chichimeca War. The reason why they were having so much hard times was because our governments up here are not centralized, or those governments as they went farther and farther north were not centralized governments. They were, as we call in my language, the shamuks, the clans. We ran that, and we were not sedentary. We were constantly moving, because one of the things our scientists told us that if you stay in one place too long, what's going to happen? You are going to deplete all the natural resources in that area. So you had to give that land time to regenerate itself. So they came in with that f philosophy of weaponizing religion, weaponizing the missions. And they came to San Diego. And I can say with all pride, I am a mission-burning Indian. Because that's what our people did. We fought back. And we burned those things down. And, 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 and you know, there were other people. It wasn't just us. But they were, I mean, these people were, were nefarious in what they did to our people. Because they... They forbid the use of our language. They, they wanted to take away our spirituality, our culture, all these things to create a void so that they could put, insert that with Spanish and then later on English. And what they, were going to, what they wanted to do was they wanted to uh, not just convert, but they also wanted to uh, teach the people rudimentary skills so they would have a servant caste waiting and anticipating in anticipation of Spanish colonists coming in. This is a fact. This is truth. This is historical. I'm not making this up. But our people fought back. Our people rebelled. And our people continue to fight.
So I just wanted to share, share those things. Now, the bells. I want to say something real quick about the bells. I, I know you guys are going to say something, but I just want to say, look, you know, something that I've experienced. You know, we, we all see these bells at the missions. Well, some of the work that I do, I've, I've, I've gone down to missions in Baja and Baja Sur, and I've also gone into Sonora, Mexico. In Sonora, Mexico, there's a group called the Kumkak. They're also known as the Seri Indians. And uh, a very proud people have resisted encroachment, you know, I mean, for hundreds of years. Well, I went over there, and I was talking with uh, one of the elders, and the language is vibrant. Even the little children speak it. They're isolated. But then I heard something. There was a bell that was ringing, and all the people got up, and they started walking to this building. I said, what is that? And the elder told me, a mission just got put up about six months ago. And every time they ring the bells five times a day. And uh, the pastor, he'll say some words and give food and stuff out. So the people go. In other words, conditioning the people again. You control the people's time, you control the people. And that's what these bells were all about. It was all about control. It wasn't about saving souls. It wasn't about doing these things. It was about exploiting resources. So I just wanted to share a little bit about that. And the last thing I wanted to share is I went farther south. And I went into the land of the, uh, the, the land of the uh, Kochimi, Waikura, and Piriku. The missions have uh, just devastated, raised havoc upon the people out there. When I go into a community, nobody speaks the language. Nobody knows any of the songs. Nobody knows anything anymore. The only tradition that they know is just the mission tradition. That is so painful to watch. Or to see a mission that's there and the people are gone because of disease. The heartbreak. Because all that knowledge that that group acquired over thousands and thousands and thousands of years is gone. Because the people are gone. So these things that, you know, we talk about, you know, we're coming out here and talking about these things, like the land base here. I just want to say this. If the Catholic Church wanted to do the right thing, they would give this land back to the indigenous people from that area. That is the right thing to do. A people without a land base is like a tree without roots. How are they going to grow? The seeds will continue to scatter until eventually they'll find it. And the other thing, too, our ceremonies, our language, that is power, ladies and gentlemen. Although it's dormant, it can be brought back. It can be brought back. And it's going to take each and every one of you to do that within your own communities. Your language is power. When you start speaking your language, when you start you know, singing your songs, when you start doing your ceremonies, that is resistance. When you start coming back into your traditional areas and harvesting your acorns or nuts or all these things, that is resistance. And it shows the people all around that we are not gone, that we are not people of the past tense, but we are here today and we will continue because this is what the Creator left us. So thank you for letting me say some words. It's an honor to be here and see many old friends and make new friends. So as we say in my language, may the Creator watch over all of you. And these words bring much happiness to my heart. And I'm looking forward to this continuing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And no uh, Sean Lovick. <laughs> Dr. Rodriguez. Okay. Um, next we have um, Dr. Lee Panich. Oh, gonna... oh you're going to switch? Okay. We're going to have Dr. Gordillo. <laughs> We're going to have a doctor um, speak. It's all you. <laughs> thank you. Stop. This is the microphone. Mm -hmm. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. My name is Bernard Gordillo. And I'm a mestizo 
immigrant from Central America, and I come here to honor the Amamutsun tribal band's efforts to remove the El Camino Real bell markers from across the state. I would like to thank Critical Mission Studies for supporting my research project into mission bells in California, some of which I present today. I would like to thank Chairman Valentin Lopez and the Amamutsun Tribal Band, Dr. Stanley Rodriguez, and Dr. Jonathan Cordero for generously granting me their time and wisdom in consultation since last year. And so I begin with a, a bit of a story. This summer, during the first half of June, I traveled to all 21 missions in order to better understand each as a distinct place where the history and aftermath of Spanish colonialism continue to impact the present. I wanted to get a sense of place by reflecting on the missions as sites of violence, sites of death, sites of shame. I went to study each mission through their church bells and proceeded to document them with audiovisual equipment. Out of the numerous moments experienced during the trip, there was one at Mission Soledad that stands out. On a hot and sunny day, with a ferocious wind blasting through the Salinas Valley, I set up my equipment at some distance in front of the entrance to the small, nondescript replica mission chapel. To the right of the entrance, close to the corner of the building, sat an El Camino Real bell marker, a commonplace if unsettling sight at every mission. To the left of the entrance, supported by a wooden beam jutting out from the side of the building, hung a rusted church bell in a uh, cast in a Spanish colonial style. Unlike the bell marker, this bell was meant to be functional. It was intended to sound. As I stood there stabilizing the camera in between strong bursts of wind, a couple passed through the very scene I was trying to capture. They were on their way to the parking lot and had likely taken in the modest mission grounds, museum, and chapel interior, part of a general fantasy mission experience that may have been the impetus for what happened next. While passing in front of me, they paused at the functional bell and one of them pulled on the chain hanging from its mouth. The sound that emanated from that bell, still ringing in my memory, is pause for reflection. Why do church bells continue to ring at the California missions? A search for an answer to this question may not be as self-evident as the most immediate response implies. In this presentation, I will address why the visual representations of mission bells that pervade California, particularly evidenced by the El Camino Real bell markers and the rain cross bell of Riverside County, are inseparable from the functional bells displayed or rung at all of the missions and their respective early histories. Firstly, I will situate the church bell and its sound within the Catholic European tradition as an instrument for the mediation of divine and earthly power, as a tool for the regulation of communal time and order, and as a weapon for the establishment and maintenance of Spanish colonization. Secondly, I will place this tradition in context of the California missions during the Spanish period. Lastly, I will connect the historical employment of the mission bell to its modern day guises in California. It is my hope to show that the El Camino Real bell marker, far from the seemingly benign symbol replicated and installed across the state as part of alleged civic service by elite social groups, is an otherwise remarkable and pernicious emblem of violence that reinvokes the horrors of Spanish colonialism. And no amount of rhetoric, action, or appropriation, regardless of their motivation, can purify the mission bell and its representations of their violent origins in California. Since the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church has employed the bell as an instrument for the mediation of divine and earthly power. The bell generated a sound that echoed the voice of God, at once projecting his authoritarian commands and omniscience over a space as auditory signals. The soundscape scholar R. Murray Schaefer has asserted that the church bell had both centripetal and centrifugal power. God's metallic and sonorous bell voice was thus, quote, centrifugal in the sense that it frightens off of evil spirits, and centripetal in the sense that it draws people together for collective religious observance, end quote. Those who controlled the bells wielded divine power through human intervention. The principle of these was a monopoly over European constructs of time. 
The religious orders of priests, monks, and nuns through churches and monasteries controlled the marking of time and imposed social discipline via the bells. Philosopher Michel Foucault has noted, quote, the religious orders had been masters of discipline. They were the specialists of time, the great technicians of rhythm and regular activities, end quote. Long before the Spanish encroachment and the ensuing pathogenic cataclysm wrought upon the Americas, church bells were synonymous with Christendom as established by the Catholic Church. The bell was a tool for the regulation of time and order throughout Europe. Cities, towns, and villages were bound to and by its sound, one so common as to denote local identity. Historian Alain Corbin has observed, quote, bells shape the habitus of a community, or if you will, its culture of the senses. They serve to anchor localism, imparting depth to the desire of forerootedness and offering the peace of near well-defined horizons, end quote. With colonial expansion on the American continent, Spain intended to reproduce a traditional European model of community, placing the mission church as the focal point of a given settlement. Church bells played an integral role in the maintenance of daily life at each mission in Alta California. However, there was neither rootedness nor peace to be had at any of them. The violence, illness, and death resulting from contact and a seemingly permanent colonial settlement inhibited the stability of a foreign and unwelcome communal model. Yet the bells did shape the habitus of a mission through the creation of an artificial community. They ensured that the native population, forced to live, worship, and labor within its sonic bounds, submitted to oppressive colonial exigencies. The church bell was used as a weapon for the establishment and maintenance of colonization. As the Spanish Empire spread across the globe, church bells accompanied the expansion of Christendom and Christianization. The Spanish introduced three explosive sounds as they founded mission after mission in Alta California. These sounds emanated from the cannon, the musket, and the church bell, all unprecedented sounds that challenged the thunderbolt as the loudest prior to their revival. While the first two terrorized and annihilated native people, the bell was much more subtle in its deployment. Far from instilling a Pax Hispana, Spanish peace, the Franciscans inflicted tremendous suffering through the mission bells in Alta California, a point to which I'll explain a bit more in a minute. The bells rang no matter what, as God's metallic voice dominated the Christianization process. The nature and function of the church bell in Alta California characterized what I call the mission bellscape, a sonic landscape consumed by bell sounds. A general landscape can be divided into four components, the source object, sound, time, and space. The source object is the bell itself, cast out of metal, tuned to a definite pitch, and typically inscribed with a date and other text or symbols. The names of the eight bells at Mission San Luis Obispo are a case in point. The five that hang, currently, in the bell wall above the portico of the main entrance to the church are named after the first missions founded in Alta California. The three historical bells on display in the mission courtyard, each dating back to the Spanish period, were given names associated with the function to which they served, joy, gloria, and sorrow. The Franciscans imported bells from Spain or elsewhere in the colonies. Once arrived, they consecrated the bells, thus converting them into holy objects. Missions typically owned a collection made up of different sizes and tones. Newly founded missions might have one or two bells that hung from a beam supported by a pair of freestanding posts. If the mission grew in size and wealth, so might the number of bells and their supporting structures, in which case they hung from the elevated piercings or openings of either terraced bell towers or espadañas, bell walls. Each architectural structure focused and directed bell sounds. The tower in particular may have served as an acoustic resonator, giving the sound weight, projection, and a severity of command. Like the source object, the bell sound was also sacred and thus, and thus sacralized time and space, though it may not have been received or understood as such. This hallowed sound permea permeated settler and native spaces alike in and around the mission buildings, imbuing everything in its path with an air of sacredness, at once a reminder that God was watching. Bell sounds communicated signals to the population within the mission bell bellscape. 
although they were used to historically sound alarm, celebration, or commemoration, Spanish chroniclers tended to link these signals to joyful or solemn events. Yet there were other, more common effective associations that held dark consequences for the California Indians. A language of the bells was not only intended to condition and discipline the native body while separating it from native notions of community, but the sound carried an implicit threat of force. It is unclear exactly what patterns or combinations of bell sounds the Franciscans used at the missions, though they were likely a combination of practices dictated by official rules adapted to a given context. Yet a recollection by Amamutsen ancestor Ascension Solorsano de Cervantes offers a glimpse into bell ringing at Mission San Juan Bautista during the last decades of the 19th century. In her oral history recorded by J.P. Harrington at the end of the 1920s, Solor Solorsano recalled, quote, these days they do not know how to ring the bells at San Juan. All they do is pull the rope and it seems like there is a fire. There are only two men remaining who know how to ring the bells, Ambrosio Rosas and Joe Rosas. There were four Rosas brothers who used to ring the bells for Father Closa. Francisco and Joaquinito have passed away. These four brothers served as Father Closa's acolytes when they were boys, and they rang the bells for him. When there was going to be mass, they said that the bells were being tolled, and when people died, they said that the bells were being doubled. Solorzano's recollection revealed a, glowing, a growing loss of knowledge of bell ringing customs at Mission San Juan Bautista. Those who carried that knowledge were aging or had passed away. Furthermore, the language of the bells had been reduced to a couple of signals devoted to common rituals overseen by the church. The practice of tolling and doubling, or repicar or doblar, uh, and their effective associations with joy and sorrow reached back to colonial Alta California, though was much, much older as a practice in the Spanish Catholic Church. These signals were so conventional that their distinctive sounds and patterns were as immediately clear to Solorzano as they were in her memory of them. The bells imposed a foreign construct of time and regimented the day chiefly towards work or religious devotion. The ceaseless ringing superseded Indian time and ruptured the sound territory of the land. The spatial reach of bell sounds characterized the mission bellscape. Scholars Kent Lightfoot and Ann Dannis have called this expanse the proximal zone, or, quote, area within earshot of the mission bells, end quote. Each of the missions had its own distinct proximal zone, as primarily defined by the topography and geoacoustic properties of the land. Much of the native population forced to live at the missions fell within the zone, as it was, quote, typically kept under surveillance by the Franciscans and could be reached by the mission guards in relatively short order, end quote. The spatial reach of bell sounds not only delineated an invisible boundary surrounding the mission, but reinforced the colonial church's possession of the land and control over its inhabitants, while it sowed notions of colonial settler belonging and entitlement. As a further consideration of the mission bellscape, I will very briefly explore silence as a counterpoint to sounding or ringing and as the primary state of mission bells. In other words, mission bells were silent for most of the time. Yet this condition may be seen as, me as menacing as the authoritarian nature of their auditory signals. In silence, bells loomed near or above the native population. Their sight would have been interconnected to their sounds as a sensory experience. Thus, seeing and hearing mission bells were inseparable from one another. This, I believe, is where the sensory violence of the mission period originates, and why any and all visual representations of mission bells in California invoke these colonial origins, particularly seen in the proliferation of the El Camino Real bell marker throughout the 20th century. By way of closing this presentation, I would like to make a couple of very brief points. How important is the mission bell to California history? There would have been no Spanish colonization without the mission bell. It was the linchpin of the enterprise. Mission bells, their sounds and representations still matter and are of grave relevance to native communities in that bells carry, deep, per, carry the deep permanent stain of colonial sensory violence in California. So I return to my initial question posed at the beginning. Why do church bells continue to ring at the California missions? 
I'm afraid that I do not have an answer. However, I do think it lies not with the Catholic Church, but with acknowledging the native descendants of the California missions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Gordillo. Um, we'll next hear from Dr. Lee Panich um, in his discussion of centering Ohlone presence at Mission Santa Clara and Santa Clara University. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> thank you, everybody, for coming. I want to start by acknowledging that we are gathered on this beautiful afternoon on the unceded lands of the Uwipi tribe of the Waswas Nation that is stewarded and cared for today by the Amamutsin Tribal Band. Um, I also want to thank the organizers for putting on this event. It's really great, um, as we are chatting up here, this is the first in-person uh, kind of conference I've been to in a long time, so I really am appreciative of everybody being here in person and tuning in online. Um, I also want to acknowledge that uh, my co-author, Gloria Gomez, who's a former uh, um, tribal council member of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area, couldn't be here today, um, but uh, she sends her regards, and I also consulted for this uh, talk with uh, Monica Ariano, who's the vice chairwoman of the Moekma Ohlone tribe. And I'll be talking about work that also includes Andrew Galvin and other members of the Ohlone Indian tribe that we've been doing um, at Santa Clara University. And I'm really pleased um, that through the hard work of tribal elders and other tribal citizens that um, we're at a place where we can come together and talk about how to tell the truth of the California missions and how to teach that truth to the next generation. Um, so just a quick background on Santa Clara University and Mission Santa Clara. So I'm a professor of anthropology at Santa Clara University, and as if you've ever been to our campus, you'll know that it is on the site of Mission Santa Clara, and it's the only institution or institute of higher education to be located at a um, California mission site, and that is kind of a, a heavy thing. Um, the, the campus today includes the sites of three different mission churches, um, like many other California missions, Santa Clara, they had to move the actual complex around due to floods and earthquakes and that kind of thing. Um, there's two main cemeteries associated with those sites. Um, there's also the native rancheria, the native neighborhood, um, that while the mission kind of moved, I guess, in a clockwise fashion, the rancheria stayed in the center. Um, and there, uh, over the years from 1777 when it was founded until the 1840s, uh, when it was eventually abandoned, there were more than 11,000 people baptized um, at Mission Santa Clara. And these were people of uh, local Ohlone descent, and then later on, after 1810, primarily from the Central Valley, um, people speaking Yokuts and uh, Plains Miwok languages. In addition to that, we also have on our campus a pre-contact site uh, known as Tamian, and as other speakers have um, pointed out, you know, Native people have been here in California since time immemorial. We know through um, archaeology that this particular settlement was occupied as, as early as 2,500 years ago. So there's a very um, deep presence on our campus. Yet, the university hasn't always um, been very good about telling the truth of that presence, to be honest. Um, the college was founded in 1851. It was transferred from the uh, Franciscans to the Jesuits to found uh, Santa Clara College, as it was then known, today at Santa Clara University. And Almost immediately, the Jesuits started dismantling the mission. Of course, as other speakers have noted, most of the land, most of the resources were already essentially stolen uh, by colonial elites and then eventually by um, US squatters. Uh, so it was really only the mission in the, the immediate complex. Um, but the Jesuits, within a decade or so, had started building over the adobe um, uh, buildings and turned it into uh, kind of a Gothic cathedral-looking um, church. And so in that sense, Santa Clara resisted a little bit of that um, kind of romantic turn that scholars like uh, Elizabeth Kreider Reed have talked about in terms of how the, the missions that were essentially um, forgotten by early white settlers, uh, primarily Protestant coming from the East Coast, eventually became kind of the center of, of tourism and of this kind of California image, uh, primarily to serve as a European anchor to lure um, other Anglo-Americans from the East Coast to come out to California. It was kind of a real estate scam in some ways. Um, and so Santa Clara, that was a little bit, came a little late to our campus. It wasn't until 1907 um, that some of this, uh, the romanticizing of the mission really got going. And that occurred when PG&E, uh, quote unquote, discovered the cemetery associated with the third mission complex. I won't get into the weeds on all the locations and stuff, um, 
But this is a site that had been marked on maps going back to the 1850s, so the discovery is in scare quotes. Um, but of course, this was uh, something of a, a major, uh, you know, momentous find, so to speak, in the local press. There were multiple newspaper articles all around the Bay Area, as far away as Fresno and other places, commenting on this discovery of the of the mission site, and um, and this is really, I think, the where some of the untruths begin. Because as um, others have talked about, and as scholars like Gene O'Brien have talked about for the East Coast, uh, settlers have used different ways to kind of put Native people in the past and to anchor European presence, so in her words, firsting and lasting. So at Santa Clara, we see this starting around 1907. The, the cemetery and the church complex were rediscovered um, in October, and by November, there was a huge celebration at the campus, and in the words of the, um, the people putting it on, the town of Santa Clara and the, and the college in those days, it was to celebrate the advent of civilization on the sunset shore. And native people were totally written out of it. In fact, the, um, you know, the remains of people from the cemetery were farmed out to different universities and whatnot, you know, a total desecration of the um, cemetery, at the same time that the you know, local people were using the mission as a way to kind of anchor European presence in the area. Um, and this was actually culminated, uh, speaking of bells, in 1929, the mission, the fifth mission church burned down in 1926. They built a new mission church. King Alfonso of Spain commissioned a new mission bell, and that was dedicated on Columbus Day in 1929. So it's all tying into this, you know, kind of European origins of California. Um, and then this was echoed many decades later in the 1990s with the 500 year anniversary of Columbus's first voyage to the Americas. And this actually also coincided, I'm an archeologist, so I have a little bit of an archeological bent on this, but it also coincided with more archeological work at that same third mission site um, associated with the rerouting of the Camino Real, actually, um, in Santa Clara. And um, the, the, when the archeological work was done, the highway was rerouted, the city, in the university built an archaeological park that commemorates the actual mission complex in that you can go there today on our campus, it's marked out in pavers, it has six feet of fill on top of it to protect it, but yet the native cemetery, the rancheria where native people lived at the mission is totally unmarked today. So you can see how these, you know, kind of erasures build on each other. And in fact, the only plaque that mentions, that could have, you know, potentially mentioned native people at the uh, archaeological park simply refers to the many dwellers who lived around the mission. So just total erasure. Now, um, the, of course, Ohlone people have not just sat back and let this happen. You know, the Muwekma Maloney tribe has been involved in stuff on our campus going back to the 1980s. I was talking to uh, Chairwoman uh, Charlene Nijma, who remembers as, as a young uh, woman participating in the construction of a Thule house on our campus. So they've um, been present. They actually, um, through their consulting services, have helped mitigate uh, some of the impacts to different archeological, um, well, you know, ancestral sites on our campus. And so have, you know, Pride and other groups, Andy Galvin, the Ohlone Indian tribe, other Ohlone groups around the Bay Area have served as MLDs. Um, you know, uh, Chairman Lopez and, and Martin were talking about some of the kind of um, shameful treatment of ancestral remains earlier in the program. And, but yet Ohlone people have inserted themselves where they can, where there is room in the laws to be there to make sure that things are handled in the correct way, as limited as that is. I'll, you know, I want to acknowledge that. Um, and so, you know, only people have inserted themselves into these issues on campus, but there hasn't been until very recently any kind of unified approach and no coordination about how we can best um, kind of center Ohlone presence and experience at our campus and at Mission Santa Clara in particular. So um, there's a couple of different things going on right now that I just want to talk about that involve, again, um, folks from the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and the Ohlone Indian tribe. And um, so I, uh, we'll kind of talk about some of that work that we're doing together. The first thing is kind of a top-down uh, well, a, a, a working group, which is kind of like the most bland thing that you can imagine from an institutional perspective. But uh, one of uh, several years, well, three years ago, I guess, our outgoing president at that time, uh, Father Michael Eng, commissioned an Ohlone, or commissioned uh, an Ohlone history working group. And so Charlene Nijma, chairwoman of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe, and Andy Galvin, president of the Ohlone Indian tribe, were on this working group. I was on it, and as were other stakeholders from campus. And so basically, this work kind of continued into the pandemic, which stretched it out um, longer than we would have liked. But we, the charge was to take a look at the way that mission history and Ohlone history and heritage are commemorated on our campus. And so we took a very comprehensive look um, down to the types of paintings that are ha hanging in different uh, campus buildings. Um, 
And so the uh, report came out last summer. It's online if you want to uh, take a look at it. Um, but we did recommend some immediate uh, actions. One actually doesn't have to do with the mission period per se, but it turns out that there was a plaque commemorating Peter Burnett in the mission church. And if you don't know, Peter Burnett was the first American governor of California, and he advocated for a war of extermination, his words, against Native people. And it turns out he was also on the founding board of trustees of uh, Santa Clara College, now Santa Clara University. His son was one of the first graduates, and um, his uh, grandkids were on the faculty. So really interesting connections that we are all learning about between kind of one of the architects of the genocide against Native people and our university. So that was item number one, get rid of the plaque, so that's done. Um, and that was something that Andy Galvin in particular had been advocating for for years. Um, the second immediate action was to remove the Junipero Serra statue from campus. That was one of the um, William H. Hannon Foundation statues that you see at many uh, Catholic schools and mission sites throughout California, placed in the 1990s. Um, so that was removed. Um, there's some community conversation that's going to happen about what to happen next with the uh -oh. bee attack. Um, <laughs> uh, with the Junipero Serra statue, um, the uh, Muekma, uh, or, well, yeah, uh, sorry, Welcome Chairwoman Charlene Nijma has um, stated that, you know, she would like to see it uh, contextualized in the museum to talk about what, you know, talk about Sarah as a figure, what he stood for at the mission period, and how he has been mythologized over the years. So to use it as a way to kind of peel back a little bit of that um, romanticization, a little bit of that mythology. And then there's also future work that, um, you know, will take place. One of the things, kind of interesting, listening to um, Martin's talk earlier, one of the things the working group recommended was getting at these individual histories, right? You know, histories of resistance, histories of perseverance of Native people at the mission. How can we um, kind of, uh, you know, bring that story to life? So that's one of the things we'll be addressing as we move forward. And then just lastly on that front, it's just also to acknowledge that it's not just about the past, but one of the other recommendations, just checking on my time, was to um, set up scholarships for Ohlone students and, um, and Native Californian students in the future. So that's something we're working on. Um, now the other side of the coin is kind of bottom-up work. And so, um, you know, the university working group, this kind of thing takes a lot of time. We have to find money and that sort of thing. But there's a lot we can do uh, working with the local Ohlone community whose ancestors, you know, came through Mission Santa Clara, survived Mission Santa Clara. There's a lot we can do in the interim. And so one of the things um, that this is, you know, the goal of this is to report on a um, community-initiated partnership grant that we received from the University of California Critical Mission Studies Program. And uh, Amy Luke, who's here, and uh, Matt Crute of Arizona State University were also on this grant. And again, we worked with the Moekma Ohlone tribe and the Ohlone Indian tribe. And the idea was to kind of be more nimble, to put some um, plans into action in the short term uh, while these other things are happening. And so working with the community partners, the overarching theme has been we are here still. So how do we put that kind of Ohlone presence back into the campus? Um, and the way we wa wanted to do this, again, was to have, that, have uh, you know, Ohlone people whose ancestors survived the mission tell the story in their own words. And so initially we wanted to do uh, video interviews and recordings, but of course COVID um, kind of threw a wrench in that. So we've done some other things. We did a virtual walking tour um, through Google, Google Earth, which is pretty cool. Um, you can find it online. It's on the Community Heritage Lab website at um, scu.edu. And there, we weren't able to incorporate video, but we were able to incorporate text from different um, uh, community partners talking about how they viewed the mission. We have stops. You know, We kind of consulted on where we should stop on the walking tour. It goes through the physical. Um, part of the campus and talks about uh, historic people like Yoskalo, who was um, rebelled against Mission Santa Clara in the 1830s. So getting that um, kind of, uh, those individual stories of native freedom fighters and that kind of thing, and giving kind of contemporary Ohlone perspectives on that history. Um, the other thing we're doing is we are now this fall starting to kind of put together a website that's gonna look at, um, kind of be a resource hub for people at Santa Clara or outside about local um, kind of Ohlone history and the, history, the native history of Mission Santa Clara. So again, we're working with those groups to kind of put together a website that will have resources that the community thinks um, you know, or, or feels best represents their uh, voices on this matter. And so not to have kind of outside experts dictating what is gonna be taught about the mission, but instead to have them kind of forefront their experience. And then lastly, um, kind of even further down the line where we had a grant that uh, Amy put together um, from the National Endowment of the Humanities to put together kind of a more robust virtual reality or augmented reality experience um, that again would kind of center those um, 
Ohlone community voices and experiences, that would really, the intent is to tie um, the past to the present. Under that theme, we are here still. And then lastly, I just want to wrap up with, um, again, I'm sorry that uh, the, my co-authors from the Moekma Ohlone tribe couldn't be here. Um, for them to kind of talk to you about this in their own words, but I just want to kind of end with a quote from Charlene Nijma, who again is the uh, chairwoman of the Moekma Ohlone tribe, and it's a quote that, you know, we were talking about, you know, how do, how do they as a tribe, how does she as an individual, as a tribal leader, see the importance of the mission period or not? And she, this is what she said, it's a story I think that needs to be told for what it is, the truth. So, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Pinnich. Okay, our last panelists, a dynamic duo down there, <laughs> is Alexi Sagona from the Ama Mutsen Band and Annie Taylor um, from UC Berkeley. And they're going to be speaking to revitalizing reciprocal relations with land, uh, the Ama Mutsen's pathways to reconnection. There you guys go. Thank you so much, and uh, it's an honor to be here uh, amongst these distinguished scholars and elders and other folks here. Mishmin Trihis Kanraka Alexi. My name is Alexi Sagona, and I'm a member of the Amamutsun Tribal Band and a PhD student in environmental science policy and management in the Division of Society and Environment at UC Berkeley. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Annie Taylor. I'm also in the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management at UC Berkeley with Alexi. Um, and I'm gonna kick it off today to talk to you a little bit about the background of how we got to be working together on this project. So luckily, Alexi and I met actually just before we began our graduate studies at Berkeley and we decided to launch an interdisciplinary project. This is very ambitious where Alexi could lead the, the social science piece, the ethnographic piece, and I could lead the geospatial and ecological pieces. And we thought, you know, together we can do some really awesome work with the Amamutsen Tribal Band and the Amamutsen Land Trust. Um, and so for me, as a, as a white and non-native researcher, I just have to say what a privilege it is for me to work with the Amamutsen Tribal Band. Um, it really is uh, an amazing experience and the trust that that is instilled in us, um, we do not take for granted. Um, and just the work that the tribe is doing, it's wonderful to get to contribute to all of those projects. So um, we are collaborating with the tribe generally on our PhD research, but today we'll be talking about a project that was funded through the Critical Mission Studies grant program, and we're very grateful. Um, so in that project, um, we're really, we set out to study the social and ecological legacies of the mission system. Um, through relationships between Amamutsun people and their homelands. So as we've heard today, all these wonderful speakers, the issues of indigenous erasure and dispossession are complex and cannot be separated from issues of ecological and environmental degradation. And so we set out to study the, these ecological and cultural issues together. So um, today we'll be talking about some of the work that was funded, including interviews with Amamutsun tribal members. So I'll talk through some of the interview work Alexi will take us through some of our main findings, and then we'll each talk through the threads of research that have emerged from those wonderful conversations. Uh, so over the past year, we conducted 12 interviews with Amamuts and tribal members, most of which were on Zoom, as you might have predicted. Um, and these conversations allowed us really to begin, especially me, to begin building relationships with Amamuts and people and to hear those perspectives in some depth. Um, and all of our research methods and questions have been directly changed and informed and transformed by the ideas and the questions and the stories of those people, those interview participants. Um, and although that, that allowed us to start our research in a way we knew would be useful and relevant to a part of the Amamutsen community, we know that that iteration and development and co-development is not over. And so that'll be an ongoing process. Uh, but we'll talk about what we've been able to start so far. Um, I'm just making sure I didn't miss anything else. I think I'm ready to hand it over to you to talk about what we found. Yes, thank you, Annie. And you know, I think this kind of falls in line with what Dr. Martin Rizzo Martinez was talking about with centering the voices of indigenous peoples, right? So using interviews as a method to center these voices is really powerful. And I'm actually really excited to share, you know, a little bit of what we found uh, within these interviews. And so, 
you know, these are just with a few select community members. Uh, and so we identified community members with experience with land-based cultural practices such as gathering or attending uh, because our, you know, project is centered on the contemporary period and human land relationships. Uh, and so these were semi-structured interviews uh, and they centered around topics participants had the most experience with. Uh, you know, we had dance captains, we had basket makers, we had food producers, right? And so we were able to really just uh, ask them, you know, uh, what they were most passionate about. And it really has helped guide our research as, you know, junior scholars, as well as, uh, you know, kind of defined uh, three different themes uh, that we're going to share with you that have emerged within these interviews. So our first theme identified was that participants chose to center contemporary tribal resilience and thinking about the well-being of the future generations uh, when asked about the instance of Spanish colonization and its effects. Uh, for example, you know, one participant discussed how dwelling on the mission history was haunting and depressing and how they try to stay focused on moving forward to honor their ancestors and bring the culture back and passing this down to future generations. And another participant discussed how they did not want to give light to the things the Spanish did to their ancestors in our interview and how they focused on tribal resilience and still being here today, as Dr. Rodriguez mentioned. Uh, we found this theme of focusing on the present and future resilience in line with indigenous scholar Eve Tuck's call for moving away from a damage-centered research framework. Uh, instead, we have centered resistance to ongoing legacies of colonialism and tribal perspectives of creating change that's more aligned with Eve Tuck's support for centering desire instead of damage while conducting research with indigenous communities. And our second theme uh, that we found within these interviews uh, was around the legacies of colonialism, which began with the mission period, of course, here in California, and the effects on access to land and the important kinship relations with non-human life. And so as many of you all know, uh, indigenous folks you know, see non-human uh, life as kin, as relatives, right? Not as things that you can own, for example. Uh, so one participant understood colonization as taking away opportunities to connect to land to fulfill cultural responsibilities, and this caused intergenerational trauma in the community today. And another community member understood introduced species as being like a disease similar to the diseases introduced in colonialism that decimated native populations. And to practice certain uh, components of culture, tribe members rely on accessing land, uh, which can pose a problem since the Amamutsun community does not own any land. Uh, you know, Dr. Rodriguez mentioned, you know, a tree without roots, you know, how can you be landless and still have, you know, be there and hold on to your culture? And one participant described conducting stewardship on Amamutsun ancestral land uh, that was held by private landowners as being difficult because some of these landowners were the, the same families uh, of who stole the land from the tribe. And it was kind of disheartening because this participant talked about how they cannot personally afford to live on their own homelands. Uh, so, you know, relationships can be a great way forward, but, you, you know, kind of knowing that uh, their ancestors, you know, are part of that problem, as Chairman Lopez was talking about, that responsibility, uh, can sometimes be difficult for community members today to be on these lands. Uh, and on a related note of accessing lands owned by others, uh, another participant discussed how an access agreement with a local landholding agency uh, required having to ask permission every time they wanted access. And they mentioned how their ancestors did not have to ask for permission and they should not have to either. So, you know, these participants understood the decimation of the ecosystem as well as land dispossession as both being barriers to engage in these important relationships between the tribe and land. And I want to note uh, sociologist Kari Norgard, who describes the uh, ecological degradation of landscapes as being a part of settler colonialism. Uh, and their work is up in Northern California. And the final third theme that I wanted to talk about was that ownership, while problematic, would support restoring these relationships to land. Uh, you know, our, this final theme kind of aligns with our commitment to center desire-based research and explores the benefits of, you know, owning property and is kind of something that, you know, we found a lot of participants really interested in, in exploring and chatting about in our interviews. Uh, so one participant, you know, dis, uh, shared a story of gathering acorns on a public preserve while a park do docent tour was occurring. Uh, they overheard the docent describing Native American practices as being in the past while they were simultaneously out there gathering traditional foods. 
Uh, the participant understood this mentality of there being no more natives left as actually stemming from the tribe not having a place to come together uh, and educate the public. And you know, understood that as being an uh, impetus for owning land being important for the community. Uh, another participant explained how basketry plants need to be regularly tended for many years to be usable and how access limitations make the process incredibly difficult. Uh, they understood having land as being important to carry on the traditional basketry. And you know, for, for some of these access agreements that the Amamutsun community have, uh, they're on five-year basis. And so you know, after five years, maybe these basketry materials uh, might not be able to be gathered. And so there's kind of that insecurity. And you know, it takes many, many hours to make baskets, uh, as so I've been told. Uh, and finally, one participant discussed how land ownership does not align with Amamuts and cultural values, uh, as like many indigenous values of owning land, uh, but it would still be helpful for the community and there could be opportunities to be more relational with land instead of enforcing the concept of ownership uh, over other human kin. Sort of like a, you know, kind of let's engage in this system and change it at the same time uh, because of the difficulties of not owning land, you know, is so tremendous for indigenous communities whose culture relies on land and these, you know, land-based culture. So as Amamutsun Tribal Band continues to grow their stewardship programs and partner with other landholding agencies, the question of whether ownership is necessary to fulfill community needs or if access held by, you know, uh, or access to land, sorry, held by partners is suitable uh, is of great significance. Whether or not, you know, these priorities should be about ownership or about, you know, really uh, getting great access agreements is, is I think, uh, important to, to think about. And so to summarize these main three themes, uh, we found that, you know, first, community members advocate for centering their contemporary experiences and the well-being of future generations, rather than discussing the traumatic experiences occurring during mission times. Uh, it's kind of sort of this desire-based research uh, that we're called to do. Uh, second, that introduced species and land dispossession both play a role in continuing to separate tribe members from the lands and culture that depends on native landscapes. And Annie is going to be able to you know, share a little bit more about the ecological side of this. Uh, and finally, uh, while land ownership may not align with cultural values, it would push back against the idea that Native people are of the past and allow for the community to come together and support import important cultural practices depending on regular access and stewardship, such as gathering basketry materials. Um, and so, Next, I want to turn to a, a case study of Amamutsun land dispossession and a future threat of our research. Uh, you know, so as Annie and I noted, we kind of use these interviews to uh, ground our research, and we have a couple things that we want to share, like uh, of how we've been able to, you know, go off of what these community members have said uh, for future uh, publications and research. Uh, and so here, I want to talk about. One clear example of the impacts on uh, human land relations can be observed through historical land dispossession of the Amamutsun. And to better understand this land dispossession, which started in the mission period, uh, we have conducted research into one mission era rancho that continues to be a site of contention for the tribe, and that is known as Eurostock. Um, so today, the tribe is leading the Protect Eurostock campaign to protect uh, this sacred site from a proposed sand and gravel mine. Uh, this was also uh, a mission era rancho that was uh, uh, owned and ran by Mission San Juan Batista just a few miles away from here, inland. Uh, we believe that the historical and ongoing property disputes and issues of Amamutsun access to this Eurostock area highlight the different forms of severing tribal relationships to land during the three waves of colonization. And so, uh, you know, we've conducted this archival research to better understand how the Spanish, Mexican and early American era land claims of uh, Rancho Eurostock have kind of shaped this landscape. You know, starting in 1803, there were you know these issues between settlers of you know who owns this land, and it's always been seen as a sacred site for the community. And the community has had to kind of you know uh, find ways to resist you know these uh, commod commodification of this land in this era area. Uh, and so, as part of our project, we've collaborated with the Amamutsun Land Trust, and this past July, we held a community event at an adjacent parcel uh, of, uh, held by the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, uh, right next to Eurostock Rancho. So this was the first large community gathering occurring in the Eurostock area, uh, and, and we're able to utilize our research, this archival research, for educational materials for <clears throat> community members on that day. 
And this uh, event was part of our commitment as researchers to support the interests of tribe members in accessing and connecting with land uh, and with Amamutsun homelands. Uh, so we wanted to bring that up. You know, it was a really wonderful day, and it wasn't just our archival research at all. It was the elders and the, the community members who were able to talk about stewardship and you know, the history of that land that really made that day special, and we were just so grateful to be able to be a part of it. Uh, and so next, I want to uh, pass it on to Annie, who's going to share another uh, uh, component of our research. Thank you. Yeah, so as Alexi has just really eloquently mentioned, this socio-ecological lens is, is critical to our study of the mission period because of the devastating impacts on people and land um, and how those are so deeply connected. And in particular, I was so excited, Chairman Lopez mentioned this earlier, California's coastal grasslands are among the most biodiverse and also the most endangered ecosystems in the world. Um, this is primarily due to development, also agriculture, uh, introduction of invasive species and fire suppression, that disconnection from indigenous stewardship here. And those are all things that are directly linked to the mission period. So there's th this need then for healing both from cultural oppression and also the ecological degradation and disconnection. And this was reflected by many interview participants in that second theme that Alexi mentioned of kinship with non-human life. Um, so I first read about reciprocal restoration in the work of Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, who, uh, I'll use her words, she stresses that the restoration of native ecosystems cannot be separated from the restoration of native cultures. And this idea of restoring culture and ecosystems is a central goal of the tribe. So much of our research now is focused on this reciprocal restoration, uh, studying the relationships between moots and stewardship practices, these cultural resources on the landscape, as well as climatic changes such as drought and wildfire. And all of this is in service of guiding future stewardship and healing with this land. I wanna just pause here to note that a lot of my work involves GIS or mapping, and I use those words interchangeably. Um, and I do believe these tools are useful, but I, we have to acknowledge they've been used globally for the seizure and occupation of indigenous lands. These are tools with colonial and military origins. And so it's important you know, for me as a non-native researcher trained in GIS to be accountable to that history and accountable also to the Amamutsun community in finding new and just ways to apply those tools. Um, so in addition to our ecological questions as those emerge from the participants, our research is also becoming an exploration of what it means to build novel spatial representation of Amamuts in landscapes and stories and relationship. Um, and I'm, I'm actually fairly hopeful that we can do this together because maps are a, an essentially relational thing. They, at their essence, um, try to describe how things are related spatially to each other. So I'm excited to see how we can grow this tool in a number of different ways uh, with the tribe. Um, and I mentioned maps because our interviews illustrated how maps and other spatial tools could be useful in promoting tribal members' access to cultural resources on the land. So whether that be food and medicine plants or basketry plants, as Alexi has mentioned, or plants used for ceremony, um, there, there's this ability to use maps to find those places. So I got you know, very excited and we began to pull together these um, data sets of different cultural resources and plants and some of these data sets, the Native Stewardship Corps of the Tribal Band had uh, collected themselves. And so I was getting all excited building these maps of cultural resources. And it was just around this time that we um, spoke with someone in an interview and they spoke about the importance of hunting, hunting and gathering in a good way. Um, and that you know, the gratitude and humility of their approach was so essential to those activities. And I was just struck, you know, stewardship and gathering is not just knowing when and where to go to find something. Um, it's not just a map. It's all of, it's all of the cultural relational values of the Amamutsun people um, that, that just maybe can't be shown or, or housed in sort of a more Western framework map or database. Um, and so that helped me realize how critical it is in this partnership with the tribe that the tribe owns and has exclusive access to those data and those maps involving cultural resources because Amamuts and people and culture are what give those maps life and meaning. Um, indigenous philosopher Kyle White, Alexi actually gave me this, uh, this idea. 
He speaks about traditional ecological knowledge being situated and embodied, meaning it cannot be taken out of its cultural context. And so that's something that is grounding us moving forward. Um, I'm just gonna check if I'm missing anything. So yeah, so initially what this work looks like is that um, we're beginning to map and model both the abundance and the seasonality of food and medicine plants in this area, in the broader stewardship area of the Amamutsun Tribal Band. Um, and we, we've got lots of other mapping projects going on and all of this is also helping us explore what novel spatial representations look like. What is an Amamutsun spatial knowledge system? And exploring that with, um, with broader parts of the community. So I also wanna say that a key piece of this work that we're excited to do is to translate these spatial knowledge systems and relationships for landowning agencies. So to speak to that third theme that emerged from our interviews, that having a place to go, having roots, um, and at the very least access and rights to gather is so critical for culture to, um, to renew itself and continue. So a big piece of this work will be translating our work for these Western frameworks and these landowning agencies and other private landowners to ensure that the reciprocal restoration and healing that the Amamutsun Tribal Band is leading can continue and can actually be um, you know, resourced so to ensure that it continues uh, perpetually. And so, you know, this might look like guiding management recommendations for parks agencies, you know, when to avoid and where to avoid things like using herbicide or suitable times of year to mow or burn if agencies are able to do that type of stewardship. Uh, it could also involve expanding gathering access. So if we're able to show that there are hotspots in places where so many cultural resources are present and would depend on continued reciprocal restoration with Amamutsun people, we can advocate for that access in this very, you know, sort of comfortable Western framework way through maps. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping to be, um, to do some of that translation work as well in order to, um, to really meet both the second and the third themes of the interviews um, from, the, from the people that we spoke with. Thank you very much. Oh. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for Alexi and Annie. Um, you're doing groundbreaking work, and I can see how this your your project will benefit all tribal communities in California, um, especially since uh, it, it built, helping build relationships with state parks uh, for that harvesting and gathering for for tribes. So thank you so much. Um, that uh, concludes our panels. Um, and we'd like to open it up for um, some brief questions um, from the audience. If anyone has any questions, um, does anybody have any questions? And I'll try to repeat since I can't hear. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, did you guys wanna go ahead and repeat the question? Yeah, so the question was, uh, for folks who are interested in this reciprocal re restoration, uh, what would be a good way to take part? Uh, and you know, I also encourage you to uh, talk with Chairman Lopez after this, but what I can say is that the Amamutsun Land Trust is doing a native plant propagation program up in Pescadero, where there is a volunteer program every Monday and Friday to help restore indigenous cultural landscapes at Kiroste Valley Cultural Preserve. And there should be more information on the website. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is there any other questions? Well, each of our panelists shared uh, a, a large amount of information and there's just a lot of work happening. So I would like to applaud um, the UC's Critical Mission Studies Project uh, for funding all of this research. Uh, and thank you so much. <laughs>